So this is a very old topic for me. Um, even on this channel, you, you could probably see how my opinion on this has changed over the years. In some of my old, like earlier videos, I used to tout more subjectivist uh, type of reasoning, um, especially back when I talked about like Stefan Molyneux. Uh, but since then, I've become far more ob objectivist, and in a sense, it's far more true to my character uh, and how I've thought about things for a very long time. Where I currently stand on this is basically like there, e there does exist a world of objective facts um, about morals, for, for morals and for art and for the quality of art that you can reasonably discern or gauge in some way, but we haven't yet figured out a way. Now, this topic has gotten me into a lot of, lot of arguments with a lot of people. Um, because it's really not mainstream, especially nowadays. Not with all the nihilism floating around in the system, but it's especially, it's, it's embedded in a lot of things. I could talk about the things it's embedded in for a long time, the things it seems it's embedded in, um, certain you know other types of political ideologies and stuff as well. And obviously, you know, I, I'm not discounting all of that, right, you know, right offhand. There is perhaps, you know, truth to it, but to what extent, right? Because the way I see it is, is um, if you, there's a specific form of, of the theory that I'm trying to suggest that I think per certainly is viable and is necessarily true um, in opposition to the subjectivist theories that mainstream folk may, may have. And I think the biggest issue that I have with them isn't so much that they don't think that it is objective, but that they necessarily insist that it isn't or that it can't be, right? And if you try to introduce things that they seemingly can't disagree with, well, they'll concede those points, but they'll still insist that, you know, that there's very, like, slow, there's very small limits on, on you know, the objectivity of art. Like, like you, can, you can introduce things, like, with musicians, you can introduce technique and things, like talent, um, and look at the, like, look, you know, there's, there's clearly a good way of, of performing certain things and doing certain things. And they'll be like, well, yeah, 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 there's that level of objectivity. But beyond that, there's nothing. That's, that's what they say. And, you know, there, there, is, there is like a pathological element to it from, from what I think. But, but it's, it's per, at a, personally for me, it's almost like painful to hear that at this point because it's like saying that, well, it's like saying that there's, there's nowhere else to go. There's no progression. Okay, that's the personal side of it, right? Objectively speaking, there is, you know, the, the, there are objective reasons why this uh, line of reasoning is viable, and I'm going to try to introduce those in the video, right? So let me basically set the stage here. Um, the way I see it, there's, there's pretty much two general forms of concern whenever you bring up that something can't be subjective or so that something isn't subjective for one they're concerned to what extent you're going to push that because obviously everyone does think that to some extent things aren't subjective yes there is objectivity when it comes to art in particular they think about two things they think number one the scientific angle of it art is not science and science is objectivity and science has this supreme status in our culture and in our world of being the thing that is objective that's that's sort of how it you know that's that's what defines it it's like you know, like this is what people talk about with like scientism. It's it's like the highest form of truth that we have, science and math. Um, and of course, that itself is complex because science is not uniform, and neither is math. And there's still problems, and there's still things that aren't resolved. Um, you know, and and that that's part of that's part of why I, th I think what I think. But but so yeah, they'll think that. And then there's the moral side of it, where they're basically concerned that you're going to start imposing things that aren't fair upon people that believes that genuinely believe something where which you can't do what you shouldn't do because you know who the hell are you to say what they believe in the funny thing about that and that side of the argument i'm way more confident that i'm right about because that itself assumes objective morals about non-imposition and where those lines are, and it's always funny to me. Anytime I wa any time I see, wh whether it's art or morality related or politics related, I see people on Twitter or or wherever 
walking into the discussion, and they're both like, well, you can believe what you want, but you imposed on me first, and that's why you're wrong. And, and that's how the debate, like, gen the, the, the dialectic always goes. You imposed on me first, so you're wrong. We both believe that imposition is bad. Let's not impose on one another, but you impose on me first, because that's what I think, and therefore you're wrong. That's, that's how it looks like from the sidelines, and my thing is like maybe the issue is what you're disagreeing about itself, not the fact who imposed upon whom. Because you could, a lot of the time, you could find very reasonable reasons why somebody, why either party would impose on the other, or why either party would feel that the other party imposed upon them. But you get into that problem if you try to think of things subjectively, because then you start to define these like fence posts in between, you know, people's territories of, of belief. And, and you have to navigate them, but you have to define those fence posts objectively. And then that has to be your, your area of inquiry. But what I'm saying is that you can't define those pen, fence posts objectively when you're dealing with issues that fundamentally relate to how everyone interacts, which, are, which is how a lot of moral issues really are. But we're still stuck in this way of thinking that, you know, people are separate, segmented individuals that are atomized and, and you know their ideals are non-fungible non-replaceable let's just define the fucking separation that's not going to work down the road because that just avoids objectivity in, in the discussion completely you know by focusing on like the superficial aspect of where are the fence posts rather than is there a deeper truth to the issue that people can't agree on so the way I see it is that there's no real dialectic when it comes to a lot of these things, primarily because people are, are stuck in this kind of subjectivist way of thinking where, you know, you believe what you want, I'm not going to try to convince you, but don't impose upon me, but then I have to get you to agree on when you're doing that, and, blah, 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 blah. and it just keeps going and it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Um, so that's why I'm confident about that side of the argument. The scientific side of the argument is more tricky. Um, the, the immediate argument people will have, especially people who've studied a lot of, of, of science, who, who are well versed in you know, the things that we think are objective about the world, um, the, they'll, they'll start introducing all kinds of, uh, throwing basic facts in you. It's like, how can you call that, uh, that artistic quality is an object? How can you possibly say that when it's like, you know, it's not like planets colliding or, or trees falling in the forest or, or processes? Um, but... So, so, so there's, there's, there's multiple levels to, to this, which is where it gets so complicated. And forgive me if I don't know enough about the philosophy of science walking into this, but from where I'm standing, hard realism um, in, in the philosophy of science has, is no longer like a thing people generally believe. Um, hard realism might apply some of the time. I don't see how hard real, you could believe in hard realism, hard realism across the board. Ever since quantum mechanics came out and general relativity, hard realism and you know, physicalism um, are basically like, like they're, they're, they're they, you, they have, they would have to be rebranded and refurbished in some sort of way. You can't retain those ideas in their original form, conceived of back in like whatever the fuck Newton Descartes times, because nothing works that way. You don't have you know a clear separation between subject and object, right? You don't have a clear sense of you don't have a clear sense of what objects even are when when you study objects down to like the lowest level your ability to gauge what they are completely disappears and now you can't tell whether they're a particle or a wave or you can't tell what what the realist you know you can't tell that they even exist when they're outside of like your ability to detect them you can't say that like your ability to interpret them doesn't uh, change them because in order to understand them and study them you need to interact with them and if you interact with them that affects the object so you're you have no uh, you you have no landing uh, like platform as far as complete hard truth you have you know you you have one interpretation after the next that seems to sort of like like fold and bend to the will of, of what truth itself is but you don't have direct access, right? And this is where Chomsky even says, like, you know, what is materialism? Materialism is just what we understand. Well, what we understand depends on us, which so it's mind dependent. So it could be wrong. Be, there might be something else that's mind dependent. And you point this out, but a subjectivist will immediately chime in. It's like, well, yes, sure, that stuff is mind dependent. But certainly, you can't say that like it's it's definitely not as mind dependent as art that that's basically what they say like you can't go you can't take the same leap and talk about art in the same way 
or morality, things that are far more mind dependent um, than these things. And to, to an extent, what they're saying is true because part of what, what the way science works, and remember, I mentioned science isn't uniform. Part of the way science works, and especially hard science, is it studies the things that um, ostensibly are the least mind dependent out there. Like mathematical concepts and physical objects are the least mind dependent things. But this is why it's important to point out that science is in uniform. That because that mind dependence thing is, is gradual. It becomes they become more and more mind dependent the further up we go. We get into economic you know, biology and then psychology and then economics and, and social science. You, now things are very mind dependent, right? Because it becomes very hard to test what is and isn't true. So you know, science. So, so in that sense, science isn't uniform, and I would not say that those theories, you know, are entirely subjective. It's just harder to tell what the objective theory is, and it may be because the I, the thing that's being gauged is so complex that an objective theory simply has not been sufficiently conceptualized to be sufficiently tested to be thought of as objectively true in the first place, and that kind of thing will take a lot of time. Um, but yeah, there's this, there, there's this, the, like the non-uniformity of science is is an important thing to point out. The other thing to point out, um, if you, if if you think of it like the argument, it's like, well, you know, art doesn't, you know, our uh, suspicion of like quality and morality doesn't exist when we don't exist. That's that's an argument I hear all the time. But the obvious counter argument to that is, well, do the laws of economics and psychology exist when psychologies and eco economies and Chemistry doesn't exist. Certainly, you'd say that they still do. Because why? Because those laws are emergent phenomena. They exist by virtue of the way that they emerge from lower level phenomena. But you could you could say that they exist all the time. They simply the the, the phenomena that needs to be there for them to be for them to show themselves in the first place isn't around. So obviously, they don't show themselves. And that way you have, that way, that is the, the scientific way in which any kind of theory of art can be viable, is that it doesn't have to be <clears throat> mind independent in a way that we can ostensibly physically say that it sticks around even when people don't, because economics and psychology don't either, right? The laws themselves are, at the very least, the domain of the laws itself depends on the existence of the subject, but that doesn't mean that the laws themselves aren't objective. So there's that aspect of it, um, and I wonder if there's a good argument against that because I can't I can't think of one off the top of my head, right? To say it's like, you know, any any thing you think of like within ethics or social science or 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 humanity subjects like history, anything, all of that stuff, any principle you try to come up with in those areas doesn't like it. It isn't. It's, it's epistemically unfair to say that those things don't exist when the subject doesn't exist, even though those things describe subjects, so the subject would need to be there to describe them in the first place. I would say that these things exist simply because the universe wills them to exist. You know, they exist by virtue of the fact that subjects exist. Right? If subjects didn't exist, it wouldn't matter because if the subject, because all that the, the law is still inherent in the in the fabric of reality in the sense that if a subject were to come into existence um, from not being in existence, those same laws would emerge. So in a sense, it's like they're always like part of the code that's operating behind the scenes. We just don't see it until the sufficient you know, triggers have, um, have happened in the empirical world. So, so there's, that, there's that side of it. Um, there was something else I wanted to mention about the scientific side of this. As always, I forget. I'm trying to improvise these videos like off the top of my head. But yeah, so there's there's that whole the, the whole um, element with with looking at us. Oh, sorry. The other thing I wanted to mention was was um, it's it an, part of this has to do as well. Like a lot of this stuff goes back to like Cartesian dualism. We have which is conventional knowledge for a lot of people. Some of this has to do with assumptions we make about what consciousness itself is. Right. Remember, I mentioned how you know materials and and um, you know objects are just things that we understand right we you can't like like once you introduce like with like scientific monism an object is no longer just a fixed object right part of this has to do with the fact that we think objects are always fixed well, once you introduce that objects aren't fixed that they're constantly changing fluxes of matter and energy that also changes on top of that it gets even weirder when you start questioning what consciousness itself is 
um, which is what the Buddhists have done, where you get into the question of like consciousness isn't necessarily the thing that we colloquially think of as consciousness because that is actually something we are imposing upon consciousness. Consciousness doesn't require feeling like you exist like in the like here in the moment in in this place, in this space, you know, and and you know sensing sight and and sound and and on all these things like consciousness. Basically, the, their whole idea is that that what we colloquially think of as consciousness is like I'm sitting here and I'm trying to do a particular thing. That is actually a very restricted form of consciousness. But if I like relax sufficiently, I can let all of those attachments go and experience true like emptiness, where um, basically like I'm not I'm not I'm not tied down to any particular thing. You know, I'm not like because because what's happening in the moment is that. My consciousness isn't just my consciousness. It's always trying to focus on specific things. I'm trying to talk to you in a video. I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to look at something. I'm trying to gauge the information. But with this, it's saying you don't have to gauge any of the information, right? The the, the whole like perceptions that you have are actually restrictions of, of general perception. And you have them because you're human, because you have to have them. But in general, they're not actually true. And what you what you go and if you go down that road, you can actually arrive at a place where consciousness doesn't need brains to exist. Consciousness doesn't need eyes or ears or sound to exist. It just needs to have this, it's just more of a, a, a more general thing of like, it's just the way it feels to be a thing, right? And anything can have that feeling. So looking at it from that perspective, consciousness can go all the way down. And if it goes all the way down, then you can rebrand all of physics as it's not just the thing that's, um, physics is not just the stuff is not objective, it's the stuff that's the most objective as far as we can see because it's the most verifiable, right? And the most like verifiable over all these times. Like every other law can, can basically be disproven once we've got enough evidence. But laws of physics are very hard to disprove. Like, and you can, and it's especially the case if you get into like, like th this is also a famous thing about like the law of thermodynamics. You can disprove any other law out there. You can't disprove the law of thermodynamics. The law of thermo laws of thermodynamics are like, as, as ironclad as it gets as far as physical laws. Um, so yeah, so, so, so yeah, you have this whole thing and, and, and I want to introduce more concepts into this of, of like information entropy turning into inf information and, and, and the seeing uh, like our, the, the progression of all life and the progression of humanity as this like informational process where we go from having less information to, uh, to, sorry, we go from having information constraints to conquering those constraints to getting to a higher level, and that itself shapes the foundation of all moral reasoning as well. And in that sense, you can look at all physical processes as not just, you know, true processes, but they are processes that humanity, with our uh, tool set, can verifiably determine in information, with information closure, right? So within mathematics and within physical systems, we can determine those systems because we can gauge the properties of the systems so well uh, that we can actually understand them from the lens of an informationally closed um, system. Like we can, like physics problems in a textbook are informationally closed, mean, basically meaning that there is no, you know, a, a, a physics problem in a textbook is a problem where you know all the information. You have all the information about what's going on in that system. And what, it, what this is saying is that all of the shit that's going on in physics are things that we can understand by thinking of them as, you know, individual uh, isolated acts within closed systems. And where it gets harder is when we actually try to have to understand things that are not happening in informationally closed systems where we don't have all the facts. And in fact, it's because of the fact that we don't have all the facts, that we don't have all the information, that part of the process happens the way it does in the first place. And that's part of what you would need, I would think, to lay a, uh, an objective foundation for morality and, um, and art as well. Uh, but especially for morality, because you would need to embed this informational process into the process of moral reasoning itself. And, and, and this goes into like my whole idea of complexity as well. But, but there's a lot of like, so, so this is where, where it's complicated because this is actually embedded in so many different things. Hopefully you get what I mean though with, with, with um, you know, the scientific side of this is that there is literally just enough wiggle room to say that there are objective facts that can be stated about these, uh, these, these disciplines. Um, especially also when you add in the fact that like science is, um, you know, there, there's only specific things 
there's, there's specific things that science can actually tell us, right? We, we use science and we use tests and experimentation and deductive proofs to validate certain intuitions, but then most of the time we just operate off of those intuitions, right? There's all kinds of things I could tell you that you can't actually prove or experiment on in the moment. You know, I, I could tell you, you know, you know, there's a big dog in my room. You can't prove that. You, you can't uh, disprove that. You can't test that even necessarily, right? But you can assume that it's true or not based on your intuition for how reality itself works, which is most of what we do. And we use science to test and validate those intuitions where they apply and where they don't or where they shouldn't apply rather than, rather than like we, we need science to, to basically constrain our intuitions, N not that all of our intuitions come from science in the first place, which they don't. Um, but yeah, th this goes even further than that. Like, like you can also, some people will, will, will argue that you can't have um, objectivity because you're not talking about an object. Quality of art is not an object. Well, what is it then? Well, I'll explain, well, how, is the color red an object? Is the, color blue, is the color of this ball an object, right? The color of the ball is experiential. I can't prove to you that I'm seeing the same color that you are even though we are all convinced that we are seeing the same color on, you know, in the outside. Um, but the point is the color itself, the quality of it, that is an experiential thing. And that is an experiential thing that I know before having ever conducted any tests on this ball or, or another ball or something that's red or whatever. And I have, and I can tell what the difference between red and blue is before having tested anything about red and blue, right? So, so perhaps there, there needs to be a whole epistemic adjustment here because we need to, again, unless I don't know enough about epistemology walking into this conversation, but there may need to be a whole epistemic adjustment because there's, um, there's experiential information that we can access before having tested it, right? And that information can inform us on something that we can try to test later on. So when it comes to artistic quality, you can think of quality as just another color that you're sensing, right? It's not physical, it's not visual, but it's still there because you're sensing it. So it is something that's there. And then you think about, okay, how do we test this? How do we figure it out? And it may not be something that's even testable. It may not be, it may be deductive, like uh, math, right? It would probably be more deductive, right? But the thing is, math is also dealing with information closure. So maybe it can't be deductive either, but then we need to adjust a whole, uh, maybe we need to develop a whole new system of validation to figure out, to figure out, you know, how how to validate it, right? If there is perhaps a way to validate it. Um, and that could be very tricky uh, itself as well. But, but these are the things, basically what I'm trying to say, I'm not necessarily saying that these things necessarily are like, are necessarily going to work, but I am saying that these things are necessarily possible. And these things would need to be, would need to work in order for there to be an objective theory of art and, uh, and, and, and uh, morality as well. On top of that, and this is a very interesting insight that I recently had, is that the ultimate evolution of any objective moral principle is to become a scientific principle. Because what do we think of as a how does objectivity work? Well, object, the way objectivity works is that objective facts are the least uh, questionable facts. They're the facts, they're the, they're the facts and statements and beliefs that are hardest to challenge because they are the most solidified. And the whole point of objective morality is to try to solidify um, you know, things about human behavior and belief and, and action and virtue, right? And if you can solidify these things, they will eventually become science in the sense that they'll eventually simply become the way things are and they would need to be the way things are in order for a new phenomena to emerge. So this is where, so this is how this connects with complexity, right? Um, to, to explain what I mean, think about it like, like, like capitalism, right? In order for us to study capitalism scientifically, we first need to abide by a system of behaviors that would have led to capitalism coming into existence in the first place. Do the laws of capitalism exist back in tribal society? Some people would actually say that they do, lol. Um, but but they, they don't, right? They, they don't until we come together as a society and we build a civilization and then we get rid of the feudal lords. Then we have capitalism. Then we can actually study capitalism. So, so the thing is like the scientific, like any scientific aspect to the system itself only emerges once a behavioral aspect has already been taken care of, morally speaking, that leads to, that leads to this new 
scientific phenomena to emerge, right? And this would have to happen as the complexity of the system increases. We start off, you know, um, we're here in capitalism uh, land right now. We have certain beliefs. We, we have certain ideologies. Once we systemize, conceptualize, and figure them all out and agree, universalize them, which assumes there is a way to universalize them, what this will actually do is it will lead to the emergence of a new scientific phenomena and a new, an entirely new scientific discipline because the system will change and new properties will emerge. At least that's what the theory would say. And that's something that, that anyone who, who, well, anyone who has genuine scientific curiosity would want to make happen because then they would have more things to study and look at, right? Um, the funny thing is, with, with subjectivity, subjectivism, you, you're almost assuming that that can't happen because you've assumed that we've already reached the peak and there's nowhere else to go but enact all the things that we just happen to like, which, which are all justified because... Well, simply because there's nothing more, there's nothing objective at stake. There's nothing to gain. In a sense, I really envy the mindset of the subjectivists because, you know, they're kind of like, it's kind of like assuming that all the big problems in philosophy have already been solved. You've already figured everything out. There's nothing else to say. There's nothing else to dig into, right? And scientifically as well. But the more you, 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 you actually start digging, the more you, the, well, at least the more I'm starting to see, like, no, 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 there's more, more and more and more digging you can keep doing. There's so much more digging you can keep doing that it's amazing that we so many people conventionally assume that there is no more digging, right? I guess what they're not aware of is the extent to which their ideology ceases the digging, or it's because they they basically assume that scientific inquiry is the type of thing that only exists for things like physics, and you know all of these sciences that have already been established as 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 you know beacons of truth for a very long time. And, you know, it's the truth is in there and we can keep studying those things, but we can't create new fields. Well, this is one of the things it's like if uh, for 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 there to be objective morals and objective art, objectivity and subjectivity would have to be mutable categories. They would have to be things that change over time because you would need to have a way for subjectivity to shift so that things like object uh, like morality and and art can enter into the sub into the objective fray and be studies as actual objects and understood as objects rather than as just subjective wins. Um, it's a lot easier to believe that, that that stuff, you know, is impossible. And it's actually probably a lot more stressful to believe that it is possible because then you're going to have to, you know, really, really start, well, you're going to have to start challenging everyone's assumptions and, and suspicions as to what is. But it's also just way more work because of how many things this thing cuts into. And it's also very difficult because if there is an objective theory, it would have to be a very complex theory because it would have to account for all of the differences in behavior and preference and all that. And that brings me to the second part of all this, which is the moral, you know, belief and argument and, and sort of um, in, in, impulse against objective uh, art and objective uh, morality is that doing so forces an imposition on someone else. And it basically turns you into some type of asshole, right? Which does make a degree of sense. Um, if you pay attention, just looking here at the YouTube sphere, the people who seem to think that there is objectivity in art, right, uh, are certainly more assholeish than the people who don't. Um, and that also makes sense because what does it mean to believe that there's objectivity? Well, it means that there's a right and wrong. It means right and wrong applies. And if right and wrong applies, and obviously you believe that you're right, or that you you must believe that you are at least sufficiently right in the moment that you believe. Yeah, you have to believe that you are right in the moment that you believe it, because if you don't, why would you believe it in that moment? If you if you don't, you would be changing your belief into something else. So the fact that you, you have a belief at all in anything, you, you have to assume that that belief is sufficiently right for you to have it at all, and thus that makes it that you know a belief that's different than that belief must th uh, hence be you know less right or more wrong so if you believe that art is objective yeah you probably believe that people who have different opinions um, sufficiently different opinions are more wrong that is almost certainly going to be the case okay um, so yeah you are going to so, so with objectivity you are going to like enter uh, I'll, you know um, you are opening up the door to a kind of you know elitism and an arrogance when it comes to this thing which is um, a downside, obviously, 
to anyone who doesn't want to experience that. But it's not a downside in the long run if there is actual merit and truth to what the people who believe in the objective standard are saying. Because what it means then is that there is more to gain for the people who disagree with them by, well, thinking about their own beliefs and changing them than it is for the objective theorists to, uh, you know, forsake their own belief and, and just say that, and just pretend like everything's subjective. There's more to gain for the subjectivists by adjusting their views than for the objectivists. Again, assuming that the objectivists are actually right, which they would have to be for this to work. So there's that side of it. And um, part of that can be amended through just trying to be a, a nicer person, I guess, which I do have trouble with, I'll admit. Um, you know, and, and trying to not just, just sort of double down on whatever opinion you happen to have, even if it is motivated partially by an objective analysis of what the thing itself is, that can only take you so far. Um, so there's that. The other argument, and, and this is the argument that confused me for, for a very long time that I was sort of scared of, which was that wanting there to be an objective theory is like wanting everyone to agree with you. It's like wanting everyone to agree on the same thing. It's like wanting everyone to agree on everything. And that's what always confused me because obviously you don't want that because for obvious reasons. I mean, for one reason is that's ridiculous. That's not possible. And the second reason is that that's just not... That there's no reason to think that that's preferable. Why would you want everyone to agree on everything when they don't have to, right? Like, like there's, a, there's a merit to the diversity of, of opinion itself, right? It also seems like a huge imposition against things like individuality and freedom, which, which, which has its own moral embeddings and, and, and stuff and history. So, so, of course, yeah, that seems like a methodological dead end. Right, but here's the thing. Um, one, my initial way of reinterpreting that was, okay, you don't want everyone to agree on everything. They don't have to agree on everything. They can still choose. There's all kinds of things they'll be able to choose. But what they do have to agree on is that certain objective standards still exist, right? So no matter what they happen to prefer, there's an objective standard that still describes what it, what, what is better. Not necessarily what aesthetics are better, but what structure is better for what kind of art. And that, that is a much, that is a much stronger, you know, that, that is a much deeper statement, I think, than just saying everyone should just agree on the same thing and like the same stuff. But my fear with that was that, and I still was, because the subjectivists had so much influence, that I was still so paranoid. But what I was thinking was like, that's still a problem, because what if, what if, as you're trying to construct an objective theory, as you're trying to, to mold together, you know, the, like this, this, this best like objective theory of, 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 ma of, of morality or art or whatever it is, because it needs to account for all the complexities of, people, of people's beliefs, what will eventually happen is it'll end up simply re-justifying the status quo that already exists because it needs to allow for every possibility, which means it always needs to allow for everything that already exists, which means it simply returns you to the place you started from, which is subjectivism. And that's the paradox that I was mentally kind of like uh, struggling with and, and gripping myself with until I realized that there's actually a very clever way around that, which is to realize that if you accept the complexity idea that what ends up happening is that these, these categories don't actually restrict one another, they just move forward up the levels, that subjectivity, what that means is that subjectivity is never threatened by an objective theory of art, right? You're never getting rid of individuality or preference or aesthetic uh, uh, preference or whatever it is. You, you're never, you know, for whatever individual reasons people happen to have to want the thing that they want, you're never getting rid of that. You're simply adding more structure to the way that those preferences are enacted that will lead all of people who have such preferences to well to a greater um, to 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 a higher level essentially of being able to actualize those preferences and actualize those artistic impulses and instincts, right? So it's not relativistic; it's absolute. You are you are introducing and it has absolute value. You are introducing an idea that there is like an absolute structure that once you've 
added it, it absolutely moves things forward and and not backward. And it's not arbitrary either. It's not just like random cultural shifts and changes. Is it's an absolute increase that makes everyone better off, even even though beforehand they may not have realized it, right? So beforehand they might have you know resisted resisted the absolute shift because it would feel like well you're imposing your preferences onto them, but the difference is if they would, because again, because the idea is that the, the shift is objective and it increases value absolutely, it increases surplus absolutely, what ends up happening is the shift is real, which means it actually still affects everyone positively and, and, and it's a net positive overall without diminishing anyone's subjectivity. And in fact, it's an even better way of, of, of it's, it's an even better way of letting subjectivity manifest because subjectivity will manifest itself in a way that's more honest, right? People can be more honest about what it is that they actually like and what isn't something that comes from them and what comes from outside of them, what comes from objective, you know, facts or, or principles about art itself. So it's not like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not like saying, well, I like stories that are, you, you know, it, it's not like saying, I like stories that have dragons because dragons are, you know, cool and dragons have value, absolute value for me and that's true for me. It's like, no, 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 that you can be more honest about that because that doesn't sound like an honest statement to me. If someone said, well, I like dragons, that's an honest statement. But if they then said, well, dragons have absolute, you know, are absolute value for me, I would say that's probably not true. I think it's possible, what if, you know, you played with dragon toys as a kid or dragons lifted your imagination as a child or there's some nostalgia factor going into there. That might be true, but the idea that dragons themselves are in in inextricably aesthetically linked to your idea of quality, that I don't believe. That doesn't seem true. You can always redefine your... Sub but, so what can be true is that is that dragons are just one aesthetic among many and what's actually objectively valuable is the structure with which the dragons are, are used in the story, whereas the, the aesthetic that you like is personal to you and your experience. So, so, so there's this nice like, way that things can actually like, coexist, is what I'm trying to say. You can have your own aesthetic because you can always, no matter what the objective standard is, you can always take your own preference and redefine it in a way where it's consistent with the objective standard. Right, you can always redefine your preferences in a way that such that they don't conflict with the objective standards, such that they simply become reduced to your individual specificities of life. What, this is also this is actually analogous to the way an economy might work. Right, you think about it like you, you think about a, an economy. It's like well, we have doctors and lawyers and farmers and all these kinds of professions, and be like, well, well, who's to choose, Who's to say which profession anyone should have? It's like that's subjective, right? Well, well, it's not totally subjective because why? Because from an objective perspective, you need doctors and lawyers and farmers and all these people because all of their roles come together, commingled, end up forming the system in a cohesive, like structurally beneficial way for everyone that works better. And that part is objective. But which one you want to be? You want to be a farmer, a doctor, a lawyer? That part's up to you because we don't have all the information about your specificities of life to tell you which one you should be. And that's exactly how objectivity would have to work if it applied to art, right? We have, in a similar vein, there's all these aesthetics and they all have a certain structure to them and there's all these preferences and they all have a structure to them. But the objective perspective is that there's a way that all these things come together that's cohesive that, that actually ends up lifting all of them up, and there's a way that they could all come together that's non-cohesive, that's kind of destructive, that would not lift them up, that would actually sort of, you know, hinder them and tear them down, and that's what we need to be aware of. Because if there's a cohesive way for all those things to come together, we need to know about it and figure out how, what it is and how it works to make sure that we all get the most out of our art that we, that we do. One of my biggest arguments, uh, you know, against the people who, who, who I would say are not being objective when they talk about art is that it's not in their interest. They think that it is, but I don't seem to, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe that it is. I think that, that their interests, there is a better version of the thing that they like out there in the universe that no one, that either no one's made because no one's thought to make it or no one has the fucking, uh, you know, no one has the talent or no one's been able to gauge the, the, the objective 
properties of the medium enough to be able to create a better version. But the point is there is a better version of that thing out there that simply hasn't been made yet that they would like more if it existed, right? And that's an objective thing. Like they would like it more if it existed for them. So, so, and this would happen universally. So, so, so the idea with this whole theory is that there are structures within art itself that would have that property. If art is objective, the way that it would manifest necessarily is that it would have the ability to, you would have the ability to take any work of art and improve it in such a way that it retains its essence for the people who like it, but they think it's better when you've improved it. And you'd be able to do this without actually changing anything about them or changing anything about their perception of what it is or what it's trying to be as a work of art. You'd have to be able to inter introduce things like that. And I think that that is possible. That's not always possible. Sometimes trying to make something better requires changing it. But then you have to, so then you have to account for that complexity in the theory. You have to go beyond and, and try to figure out how, how that would work as to what extent does changing the essence of an artwork, um, the, what, to what extent does that, you know, act as some sort of, to, to what extent does that act as a counter argument to any kind of objectivity within art because you know perhaps perhaps you could make the argument that certain essences are better than others you know certain essences are more preferable right especially if people prefer those essences more right it's again it's it's all about honesty and, and half the time like you could always say that you don't like the, the you know art that's better you you can always say that like this art you know like let's say that there's a movie Let's say there's there's a movie that's that's um, you know some some movie that's like objectively good. It's an objectively good movie. Everyone agrees. You don't have to like it, but you have to be honest about why you don't like it. Like you your reasons could be totally like irrational and ridiculous and personal to you, and that's fine, so long as you're aware that that's what they are, right? So long it's like I don't you know I have this myself. There's there's a game like there's a game like Witcher One, which I don't think is a very good game, but I still play it because it's it, because of nostalgia. You know, it's just nostalgia to me, and that has value to me, and that's fine, um, because I am not letting my personal preferences in any way override my sense of what's objectively valuable for the medium itself. And the way to think about this mathematically is is if you think it's like if you think that 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 art is like we're we're operating in R two, we're operating in two dimensional space. You know, the quality of an artwork is like a function on that space. Just, just as a basic analogy, it's not a very deep analogy, but it's just basic analogy. So you can think of it as a function on that space. Okay, so, 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 what the way people assume objectivity, like it's trying to say that art is objective works, is that they assume you're trying to restrict the space. You're trying to restrict the domain itself and say, like, no, 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 no. this domain is restricted. It's not like. Like you can't have everything in the domain, you need to have only specific things. And that perhaps is how objective art theorists work all the way back in like fucking, you know, all the way back in like like the Renaissance or whatever. But um, yeah, so, so or, or the medieval era where, where objectivity came from God or whatnot. So yeah, you have art in this objective space. Um, you're not restricting the domain, but you might be restricting the properties on the functions themselves. So, for example, again, going back to R2, there's certain, you know, in mathematics, there's certain functions that we like simply by virtue of the fact that you can save more things about them. They have nice properties like continuity and differentiability and being infinitely differentiable and smooth. Like, there's all kinds of functions. And there's an infinitely, there's uncountably many such functions. You can have all kinds of, you can construct functions that have all kinds of other weird properties while satisfying those properties. But we prefer those functions because you can say more about them and you can develop theorems. I mean, what can you do with a function that isn't continuous? Not a whole lot, right? You can try to prove whether, you know, what, what are some other properties that it might have. But the whole point is that there's this, like, structural drive to, to arrive at more insight. And you get that from certain properties more easily than others. That doesn't mean that you don't get those from other properties as well, but it's harder. So there's still this objectivity in the sense that, you know, in the sense that you you still need to have something of, of, of complexity and substance that's there, right? The way to think about this as well is to say, well, like an objective, basically with objectivity, you can't say anything that's too limited. You can't say that like it's only functions that have to be continuous and smooth. 
It's like, no, 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 you, you don't need to have just that criteria. You can add more criteria. You could say, well, they could be continuous and smooth, except for in this case where if they're not, you know, they can be, they have to be continuous and smooth, except for in certain cases where, so, so then it becomes like an if-then statement, right? If certain conditions are met, the functions need to be continuous and smooth. So in a certain medium and a certain type of artwork, they need, the functions need to satisfy these properties, and elsewise they need to, you know, satisfy some other set of properties, another condition they need to satisfy some other set of properties, and you can have this entire, like, hierarchical, like, tree, logic tree, determining all the different properties that would need to be satisfied for quality to be, you know, a, to define objective quality in every single case, you know, and they could be very complex, and so you have this whole, like, like almost this pyramidal logic structure that, that's telling you, you know, what needs to happen when for, for objectivity to actually take root and, and take hold and, and um, for the art to have more value in that way. And here's the other thing that about it, it's like, it, you, it doesn't need to be a discrete thing either. It's not like you have a line, subjective and objective. You can have a, a, a gradient between them where you go from subjectivity to gradually go to objectivity, like there's standards that are more objective than others, which also makes sense if you consider the fact that um, no analysis is ever complete no analysis of any work of art is ever finished, you can always add more to the analysis, which by the way is another reason why subjectivity is not threatened by objectivity, because you can always add more to any analysis. No matter how true we agree on one thing, we can always find a new way to reinterpret it. You know, if we come in and say like, oh, Star Wars Episode Eight is a bad movie, there's all kinds of other ways, other statements we can make about that. There's, there's all kinds of new ways of perceiving that and trying to understand that badness that we can go even deeper if we try to think of it in a in a more logical way, right? And and that's actually and I've already noticed this happening in some of my videos and my quality analyses is that you know I'll I'll have an you know I'll I'll present my analysis and people have deeper insights that I didn't even have yet because obviously I can't cover everything in a single analysis, you know. There's I don't I have finite time I have I have and I forget things, you know. So so you're always constrained in some ways. You know, people can always pick up the pieces where you know where you leave off and add more structure and, and value to the analysis. And when they add more structure to the analysis, that deepens it and makes it more objective. If it's actually, if it's actually you know, cohesing, I guess, cohesing to what the structure, the objective structure seems to be. And it is possible that, of course, that what what we think of as a, as objective, what I think, what anyone who agrees with me thinks, is totally wrong, and we need to completely redefine it. Right, but then what you're doing is you're you're going in to the discussion ready to leverage your own sense of what objectivity is against everyone else's sense in that discussion and thus saying, Okay, well the reason we're wrong is not because it's a difference of opinion. The reason we're wrong is because there's an even better way of thinking about the art than the way that we're thinking of. Right? And that's fundamentally the driving force here is that I'm really trying hard to structurize it. Going back to my whole continuity R2 thing, you know, it's it's not so much about what, it, it's not so much about, again, this, this is us all assuming the epistemic rules of mathematics, but it's not so much about the functions of quality having to, the, the quality function having to satisfy certain specific properties, it's about the structure of, it could be about the properties, but could also be about the structure of the, what properties apply when under what circumstance, because of course art is so complex, it, there's so many genres and mediums and ways of expressing everything that, that it's almost impossible to account for all that complexity. And it may very well be t completely impossible, but we can still get close and we can still get nearer and there's still generally good insight to be had and, and objective insight to be had by doing that, right? So, so you can't stop doing that and for who knows, very well one day that whole like, like the, there's a certain, there could be enough of a structural, like, like objectivity to it that once that structure is discovered, it'll become universalized and embedded enough that it could very well become objectivized to the point where we just accept it as, as general fact. Kind of like mathematics. Even though if you look at mathematics, math, math has all kinds of holes in it as far as the assumptions it's making. I mean, just look at the axiom of choice. That there's all kinds of like unresolved things that you won't ever be able to resolve. Right? But the fact is like you're still driving towards something that is objective, that, that seems so universal and, and so hard to disprove 
that it becomes embedded and embedded and embedded until it, it ascends to this status of supreme truth, as I've said. And yeah, what I'm saying is that that's, that's basically viable, that there is such a structure. But the thing is, like, no one's just conceptualized it yet. If Basically, if such a structure exists, it is so hard to conceptualize that no one's been able to do it yet. People just all operate with little bits and pieces of it, and they share those pieces, and um, they, 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 you know, the, the system still moves, it still progresses, you know, art still evolves, it still gets somewhere, but it hasn't, it doesn't get anywhere, it, it hasn't gone as far as it could, because not enough conceptualization has happened yet that would simultaneously introduce structure to, to an objectivity to the medium in terms of quality, whilst at the same time retaining, you know, all the different variations of people's preferences and complexity and interest. And, um, yeah, but, but the whole point is, is I'm saying it's like, the, the more I think about it, the more viable it seems, because the more I, the more I can sense how, like, how, how little, how little conceptualization has even really happened in this area. So, yeah, I guess that's, that's essentially, that, that, that's essentially where we're at. Um, Cheers. Yeah.